Where do I even begin to talk about Keyforge? I could start with the fact that unlike in other collectible card games, in this one, you don't get to build your deck. You open a pack, get out 36 surprises, and for better or for worse, that's your lot. Of course, I could launch this video with a mention that all decks in Keyforge are procedurally generated with the almighty algorithm, all oh bless she who hears all, responsible not only for your deck's composition, but also the artwork on the back of the cards and its name, ending up with such utter gibberish as the surely pretentious guard of Bearaphon, YJ just drown of the empathic lake, or, uh, okay, I deserve this one, champion Laszlo of no pun included. Or, I could start with the fact that every single deck in Keyforge, and it has already sold in millions, every single deck in Keyforge is 100% FDA certified unique. That means that when you buy your deck, it will be your deck. Alternatively, I could start with the fact, actually, that that's, that's all the beginnings. Dear viewers, I used up all of my beginnings. Well, that means that this video will have none. In Keyforge, like in other collectible card games, you will be pitching your deck against your opponent's deck. But unlike in other collectible card games, instead of trying to reach, oh, I don't know, let's just come up with a random goal like reducing your opponent's life total to zero, you will instead be trying to forge free keys. Each of your decks will be composed of free houses that the algorithm chose for you. There are a total of nine houses available in Keyforge, although any given set will only have seven of the nine houses. For some reason, I feel this really burning desire to do a Voyager reference. No idea why. The houses are your first exposure to Keyforge's theme, which I like to label as delightful nonsense. You are mighty archons trying to Forge keys in the planet glued from bits that's called a crucible for some reason. And all that really means is that you'll get to pilot a team composed of green little men, robot librarians, and noble Roman dino dudes. Or, if you're lucky, you'll get to open a pack with my favorite house, this. Actually has this, this worked out. A faction entirely composed of rude people just yelling at each other, or as we call it in England, the House of Commons. Keyforge lets you know immediately that it doesn't take itself too seriously, but it's not dark to the point where it's not interesting either. It straddles that fine line of being ludicrous, but appealing because I just want to play with these cards. Yes, give me a Draco Preco, and I could cuddle this Calfine all day long, and sometimes it even borrows characters from the Marvel Universe, like the incredible Narp, who brings along all his best catchphrases, it's Narping time, who let the Narp out, and my favorite, you can't handle the Narp. His deck's called Courier Harley Zactacane. I told you, complete utter gibberish. But just because Keyforge is very daft, it doesn't mean it's also not smart. Designed by Dr. Richard, I created Magic the Gathering Garfield himself, it puts some very clever spins on the card battle formula. As mentioned before, you win a game of Keyforge by forging free keys. To forge a key, you need to collect six or more amber and retain them until the start of your next turn because that's the only time you can forge a key. You can get amber by playing certain cards, by activating various abilities on the cards that you've played, but predominantly by reaping. You can reap as long as it's your turn and your creatures are not exhausted and they belong to the active house. And that's where things get very clever. Remember lands, mana, casting costs, well, forget about all of that, because in Keyforge, you can play any card that you like and as many of them as you want. As long as they belong to the active house. Let's say that it's my turn and I've chosen House Brobna. I could play my Narp, my other Narp, and my Mega Narp. This is great. I now have free Narp, although do note that I can only put creatures to my left or my right flank. This is important for a number of reasons, but in this case, my NARP say that its creatures cannot reap. 
Now, alternatively, I could fight my opponent's creatures, but to do that, my creatures have to be unexhausted and they come into play exhausted. So I have to wait until the end of my turn to do that. Talking of the end of my turn, this is when I draw my cards as well. Because my draw limit is by default six and I played three nubs, I'll draw three cards. Cool, I've got a full grip, I've got my nubs, I am ready to do things. And my opponent did indeed play some non nubs that I would really like to get rid of. But to do anything with House Probna, including attacking or reaping, I would first have to activate House Brobna. But the problem here is that I no longer have a single Brobna card in my hand, and if I activate House Brobna, I can only play House Brobna cards. This is a puzzle that never fails to delight. I could make plans for many turns ahead, figuring out what I'll play and what I'll activate, but Keyforge is a dynamic field. I'm not just building my board presence, I'm responding to what my opponent does and keep getting surprised by new draws. That's Interesting, let's talk about Tempo, which is a concept invented by Magic the Gathering theorists, although arguably applies to all card games of this type. Imagine it as a tug rope with someone always having a strength advantage. And now imagine that tug rope as your board presence, as in how many cards you've played to your board, or more accurately, how good those cards are at giving you the leverage to push you towards winning the game. If you have Tempo, you are not fighting back, you are comfortable and can push your advantage. If you don't have it, your focus isn't so much winning, but clawing that advantage back. In most card games, tempo is binary. You either have it or you don't. In Keyforge, you have three thresholds. Every card game is a race to the finish line. Be the first to do something and you win. Tempo is defined by that race. But because forging a key is generally a point of no return, this race is split into three laps. So you could do something like fight over your opponent's supply of amber, potentially stealing it and taking it for yourself, or capturing it and putting it on one of your creatures, which is great up until that moment where the creature dies and then your opponent gets all of that amber back. Or you could alternatively realize that you're in a losing battle and opt to let them forge a key whilst you work towards dismantling their advantage. I realize I'm going a touch too deep for a regular review and making it sound like a crunchy competitive experience rather than just a silly good time. Honestly, to have a blast with Keyforge, you don't need to think about things like tempo or board presence. You can just play a card. It has an effect, it has some restrictions, they're simple but clever, and you never have to worry about having a neat card in your deck that you can never play because you haven't played 15 lands yet. And my gosh, is it forgiving? If you really like your deck, but it's a bad bunk and your friend keeps beating you, there's even a handicap system that you can adjust however you like. You don't have to use it if you don't want to, but isn't it great to have a competitive card game that offers depth and complexity, but it's also just aimed at having a chill time with your buddy and lets you make it your own. This is all I want a card game to be, nothing more, Nothing less. Of course, some people get a real thrill out of building a deck, and that's fine. That just means Keyforge isn't for you, and probably never will be. But now, let's talk about the cow fine in the room. This is where Keyforge's real brilliance lies. No, it's not the clever and innovative use of algorithms, but the fact that it understands that actually algorithms are pretty stupid. Every time social media CEOs and tech giants try to convince us that they're amazing! I can't help but wince because my Twitter still thinks that I'm into Love Island. There's nothing wrong with Love Island if you like it, but I'm still not sure I know what it is, what it does, or what I wear it with. Earlier in 2018, we reviewed Discover Lands Unknown, Fantasy Flight Games' second foray into procedurally generated games, and it was a misunderstanding and a disaster on the scale of cats. No, not the movie, I mean actual cats. Why would you keep a miniature lion in your house that will eat your face as soon as you die? Whose idea was that? Looking back, it's clear that Discover's real fault was its over-reliance on technology. I'm not saying that computers can't make art. 
I just don't expect it to make any sense. Thankfully, if your deck does end up being gibberish, part of the fun of Keyforge for me is untangling it into something beautiful. Let's take a look at my mega NARP deck again. Yes, I realize I'm a bit obsessed. Not only is it oppressively crammed with big dumb things from House Brobna, but the rest of it is designed to let me draw lots of big dumb things or revive big dumb things. And let me tell you, I am big dumb here for it. From a strategy perspective, this is questionable. The typical flow of a collectible card game is to establish some sort of a board presence and then use that board presence to gain an advantage, normally via attacking. Keyforge flips that on its head by saying, actually, you can attack, but all that does is clear your opponent's board. To win, you have to get Amber. To get Amber, you have to reap. And to reap, you have to not fight. But then my deck is crammed full of things that don't actually let me reap. Playing a Keyforge deck is the equivalent of owning a windmill when you're allergic to wheat. Here's the thing about windmills. You can mill anything. It don't have to be wheat. It could be buckwheat, buck's fizz, could be shoes. As Gandalf once said, all we have to decide is what to do with the windmills given to us. Yes, I do have a deck full of big stupid creatures that don't actually win me the game, but if I keep deploying them, and if I keep fighting with them, then I'll kill anything that my opponent has on their side of the table. And if they can't win, then they can't win. Actually, scratch that. I'm pretty sure this deck is terrible. No human being would have ever designed this. This is basically the village idiot who keeps bringing his inventions to the tavern for everyone to see. Except in Keyforge, this village idiot is the norm. It's like a secret cinema version of Futurama where everything is absurd and stupid, but I never want to get off of this ride. And I get it. Some people find immense joy out of building their deck and out of competing with it. Magic is a thrill and some of my best moments in games have been at a magic tournament. When people asked me what magic was, I frequently described it as an equal combination of chess and poker. And I still think that's probably the most apt analogy. Imagine reading your opponent so well that you know the exact composition of their hand without even looking at it, and you know the exact next move they will make. You are in the zone. You are Neo. Every card they play leads them further into your trap, and every card you play dismantles the foundations of their reality. Imagine how good that feels. But if I have to be honest, I have to admit that that moment is incredibly rare and fleeting. So frequently we talk about magic as an addiction, the urge to open yet another pack and hopefully find a shiny tchotchke you've been after for so long. And if you ask me, I think the actually addictive part of magic is chasing that dream of a perfect game. In 2002, Mark Rosewater, the current lead developer of magic, whose IMDb profile lists him having written two episodes of Roseanne, penned an article called Timmy, Johnny and Spike, coining free player archetypes types that the development team constantly strives to please. I guess in 2002, only men played magic. To summarize, Timmy is someone who likes to play big cards. He was the first person in the NARP fan club. Spike is a typical tournament player. It's all about efficient plays and efficient wins. But here's Johnny and Johnny, to quote Mark Rosewater, is the creative gamer to whom magic is a form of self-expression. Johnny likes to win, but he wants to win with style. It's very important to Johnny that he win on his own terms. As such, it's important to Johnny that he's using his own deck. Playing magic is an opportunity for Johnny to show off his creativity. Many have argued that magic by now is an outdated game with outdated mechanisms. Playing lands to generate mana is clunky and so on. I would probably agree with that, but what I think is really clunky about magic is this constant need to affirm all free player archetypes. Every set filled with cards that want to please everyone, but nobody can agree what it is they actually want out of it. It's like having your dinner at the all-you-can-eat world cuisine diner. You can have sushi, pizza, and kebabs on the same plate, but honestly, you wish you didn't because nobody knew how to cook it. Keyforge is for Johnnies. Sure, you don't get to actually build your deck, but you have ownership of your deck. Your weird, stupid, impossible deck. It's like nothing else 
in this world. You adopted a stray, scruffy looking dog that barks at her own tail, but you love her because she's yours. And when you win, you win because you figured your deck out. But just before I inevitably recommend Keyforge, I would like to talk about something that I don't have to when talking about regular board games. I have a bit of news for you. Believe it or not, I am not your dad. Shocking, I know. But just because I'm not your dad doesn't mean we can't talk about addiction a little bit. Look, you're a grown person, unless you're not. Do what you like, buy what you want. But despite what I said earlier in the video, the random pack model is still addictive. And yes, absolutely the only reason they package games like that is to abuse that addictive quality to make more money. Before Worlds Collide, the first set of Keyforge, I would have argued that out of all of the collectible card games I've played, it's the least reliant on it. You buy your deck, you milk it for fun until it's dry, and then and maybe get another one. But with the introduction of cards like Anomalies, rare trinkets you don't get in every pack, the push to buy more becomes more evident. I'm sure you don't need me to tell you this, but as someone who has an addictive personality myself, I'm very aware that it could all devolve into, I'll just buy another pack. So there you go. Keyforge is fantastic, and I hope it sticks around for many years to come, a struggle all non-magic collectible card games face. But if you have an addictive personality, consider this PSA an opportunity to ask yourself this question. Do I really need this?